over the next two weeks, instead of doing regular content in class, we're going to take an opportunity to take some of the material we've already learned, namely things associated with stoichiometry, and apply them to an actual situation where stoichiometry is used. I think it's important to see these calculations in their actual setting in order to fully understand what they're designed to do and really get an appreciation for what this math is for. This video in particular uh, focuses on a procedure walking you through the process if you do not have a kitchen balance or scale available. If you do have a kitchen balance or scale available, I encourage you to watch the other video uh, that provides that procedure for the kitchen or balance. Uh, that process will definitely get you some better results. However, both of these processes work just fine. Uh, and you're never graded on the quality of the data that you produce, simply on how you work with that data, how you discuss and explain what's going on. Let's start this video with a quick overview of the kind of things you're going to be talking about. We're going to start with a rundown of the introduction and objectives of the experiments. We're then going to dive into the actual chemical reaction itself. Once we understand the reaction, we'll dive right into the actual procedure. Our first order of business will be recording the mass of baking soda that's used. We'll then use that mass to calculate the theoretical yield of our reaction using stoichiometry. We'll then go through the process of running the actual experiment and collecting the data on how much carbon dioxide was produced. We'll talk about how then to calculate that mass of carbon dioxide collected or our actual yield. And then finally, we'll wrap the experiment up by calculating the percent yield of our chemical reaction. Throughout this process, I'm going to go through a demo trial that you can use as a template for performing the trial that you need to do at home. Everything that's covered in this video is also covered typed up on the actual lab experiment sheet. This is designed simply to be a supplement to help those of you that need a more visual explanation of what's going on, work your way through the experiment without having the luxury of us in the classroom and me being able to walk you through certain problems. As always though, if you're struggling with the experiment, you can contact me at any time during the week and the following week to get information and help on how to do your experiment. So to start us off, let's go through some of the objectives of the experiment. I think it's very important to know why you're doing an experiment such as this one before you start trying to actually accomplish the experiment itself. First off, uh, our job is to use stoichiometry to predict the outcome of a chemical reaction or theoretical yield. This is the sole purpose of stoichiometry and what it's designed to do. And I think it's important before you walk away from a topic like this to have an opportunity at least once to use it for its intended goal. Once we've finished the stoichiometry, our next job is to perform that actual chemical reaction based on the setup we use in the stoichiometry calculation. And the reason we do the two of these together is because the ultimate goal is to compare the outcome of your real reaction, the actual yield, to the prediction from the stoichiometry, the theoretical yield, by calculating what we now know as a percent yield. And there's a lot of different types of yields. And again, seeing this thing happen in person, I think is going to create a much more tangible experience for what stoichiometry is and how all the math surrounding it really gets an important job in chemistry done. Now that we know why we are doing our experiment, our next order of business is the actual reaction itself. This reaction again is available through the lab data sheet, uh, but here it is uh, for the video as well. We're gonna start our reaction by taking NaHCO3, sodium bicarbonate, that is our baking soda. Depending on the procedure you are following along with, you're either gonna weigh out a specific sample of sodium bicarbonate, or you're gonna get a certain number of teaspoons of sodium bicarbonate, and then determine the mass you have available through some calculations. We're gonna be combining that sodium bicarbonate with uh, acetic acid, better known as vinegar. Uh, each time you do the trial, you're gonna use approximately one cup of vinegar and you're gonna place that directionally in a reaction vessel. The amount of vinegar you use isn't super duper important as long as it's about one cup. Uh, since the vinegar is not going to be our limiting reactant, having a little bit extra or a little bit less uh, isn't gonna affect the outcome, hypothetically. When the two of those chemicals combine, it's going to produce a reaction that I think many of us are very familiar with. A lot of baking soda volcanoes are made in this fashion. Uh, it's going to produce a couple different products. Uh, you're going to get sodium acetate and water, and these are chemicals that are going to remain inside the container at the end of the reaction. That's what's going to be left over. And it's just going to look like regular old water because the sodium, bicar or the sodium acetate dissolves very, very well in the water. The other product we're going to be creating is the one that we are interested in this experiment. The carbon dioxide is going to be formed as a gas, which is what carbon dioxide always is at room temperature. It'll be our job to record the mass of carbon dioxide that is produced in this reaction. And we're going to do that one of two ways, again, depending on the procedure you're using. 
If you're using a balance, we're going to record that by taking the difference of the masses of the reactants and products, and we'll talk more about that down the road. If you don't have a balance, we'll be capturing the carbon dioxide using a balloon and then making some measurements of that balloon to determine first the volume of carbon dioxide formed and then ultimately the mass of carbon dioxide formed. Regardless of the procedure you're going to be working with, uh, you're going to be doing exactly the same stoichiometry as everybody else. And that stoichiometry is going to be based off of the amount of sodium bicarbonate we start the reaction with and the amount of carbon dioxide we're expected to produce in the reaction. And we're going to need a mole-to-mole -mole ratio that links the two of those together. Luckily for us, this is a very simple reaction that's easy to balance. It's a one-to-one mole-to-mole ratio. And we'll save that number for a little bit later on in the video. We're now ready to start discussing the experimental procedure for this experiment, but before we begin, I want to re-emphasize this video is designed for people who do not have a digital or manual balance available in their homes. If you do have one of those balances, I encourage you to use the other procedure that describes how to use that balance to collect similar data. You will get better results with the digital balance, but as I mentioned before, we'll get perfectly reasonable results without that digital balance. If you don't have a balance, Stick here, we're gonna go through the procedure on how to make measurements by collecting volume. If you do have that balance, switch over to the other video. To start the setup process for performing our chemical reaction, we're gonna to need to have a specific amount of baking soda. Now the amount of baking soda you choose to use in your particular trial is entirely up to you. It doesn't matter how much you use. My only requirement is that the amount of baking soda you choose to use in your trial is different than the amount of baking soda that your partners use in their trial, so that we have an array of different measurements to work with. Even though you get to choose the amount of baking soda you want, we do need to know specifically how much baking soda it is. That's what's going to determine the amount of carbon dioxide you produce and ultimately your theoretical and actual yields. Now because you don't have a digital balance available to you, the tool we're going to use to measure the amount of baking soda is going to be a set of measuring spoons like this one here. This will allow you to basically get increments of baking soda in any number of uh, teaspoon measurements. My set goes all the way down to a quarter of a teaspoon and then up to as many teaspoons as they want. And you can choose a value anywhere between zero teaspoons all the way up to two teaspoons of baking powder. When you go to measure this, you're going to measure that baking powder into a separate container, such as this tiny little bowl that I have here. Now the only thing we have to be very careful of when we do this is you need to get as close to a very specific amount of teaspoons as possible, and that's what this device over here is for. Uh, this is a device used for icing cake, because you don't need to have something like this. As long as it's a straight edge, even like a butter knife will get the job done. To measure out our baking soda, I'm going to open up my container. I'm going to choose to work with one teaspoon of baking soda, and what I'm going to try and do is scoop out an excess amount and then use this little scraper guy to scrape the surface as level as possible to get as perfect a teaspoon as I possibly can. I'm going to transfer that teaspoon into this container here, and then we've got our sample of baking soda measured and ready to go. Now that we've made our first measurement, the amount of sodium bicarbonate in terms of teaspoons, we have to convert this into a value that we can use in the lab setting. We typically want to know the mass or the number of grams of sodium bicarbonate. This can be determined from our teaspoons with a couple quick conversion factors. Uh, doing some quick re research online, I was able to see that there are 4.93 milliliters for every one teaspoon, as well as 2.2 grams for every one milliliter, which is the density of our sodium bicarbonate or our baking soda. Taking those two and rewriting them as conversion factors, we can do some very simple dimensional analysis to convert the one teaspoon that I chose to do for my experiment ultimately into uh, a number of grams. Our first conversion step was to convert our teaspoons into milliliters, lining things up so that teaspoons and teaspoons are diagonal. Our second step was then converting the milliliters into the grams using the density, again lining up units so that they're diagonal. And I was able to determine that my experiment has 10.9 grams of sodium bicarbonate available for the reaction. Now that we started collecting some data, it's important to have a place to put that data. If you have not already done so, you should be creating a data table similar to the one that I've created here. Notice my table has space for three separate trials. You have three members in your group, and each group member is going to be responsible for one of these three trials. I'm entering my data in trial number one, my partner would enter his data in trial number two, and my other partner would enter her data in trial number three. 
Uh, adding that information in, so far we know that we've used one teaspoon of the sodium bicarbonate. That's what we measured in the lab. And from that measurement, we were able to calculate that that corresponds to 10.9 grams of the sodium bicarbonate. This is a number we're going to be using uh, for the rest of the experiment. It's probably one of the most significant measurements we've made thus far. Now that we know the mass of the sodium bicarbonate that we're going to be working with, we can now calculate the theoretical yield of carbon dioxide that this sodium bicarbonate should be able to produce. This is a stoichiometry calculation, and we can treat this just like any other stoichiometry problem we've done so far. We know the mass of the sodium bicarbonate. We know we want to predict the amount of uh, CO2. We know the balanced chemical reaction, and thus we know the mole-to-mole -mole ratio. If it helps, we can actually write this problem as if it were a stoichiometry problem. There's our balanced chemical reaction. It's a one ratio all the way across. And our job is to calculate the mass of carbon dioxide produced by completely reacting 10.9 grams of sodium bicarbonate with an excess amount of acetic acid. And that 10.9 grams is the 10.9 grams I just weighed out. In your experiment, you're going to have a mass different than 10.9 grams. You're just going to replace your number into the place where my 10.9 10.9 grams is. To do a stoichiometry problem, we of course need a mole-to-mole -mole ratio. We determined this mole-to-mole -mole ratio earlier as a one-to-one -one ratio, and now we're ready to start our dimensional analysis problem. We start with the 10.9 grams that we measured out. Again, your number is going to be different than this. Our first step is to convert grams of sodium bicarbonate into moles using the molar mass of sodium bicarbonate. I'll then use the one-to-one -one ratio to convert my moles of sodium bicarbonate into my moles of carbon dioxide. And last but not least, I'll convert my moles of carbon dioxide into grams of carbon dioxide. Punch all this information into your calculator, and according to our setup here, this particular trial, I should be producing 5.71 grams of carbon dioxide in an ideal situation. Just like earlier, we'll take a moment to update our data table. We now know the theoretical yield of from stoichiometry in grams, and that is now 5.71 grams. Now that we've gotten our sample of baking soda, and we've determined the theoretical yield of our reaction based off of the stoichiometry, it's time to actually set up the reaction itself so that we can ultimately calculate the actual yield. We're going to be running the reaction in this clear container here. This is an empty Gatorade bottle. The container you use is entirely up to you. The only requirement is, again, it's relatively large. A soda bottle or something like this will get the job done. And the neck is narrow enough that you'll be able to get a balloon around the lip of the bottle uh, and hopefully get a nice tight seal so none of your carbon dioxide escapes. I like these Gatorade bottles not only because they're the right size, but they're also nice and rigid as well. And this is going to prevent the bottle from expanding under pressure when that carbon dioxide is produced. It's going to give me a little bit of a better result. You don't need a bottle like this, though. Anything like this will get the job done uh, so that you can make your measurements. Our first order of business in setting up the experiment with the bottle then is to add in the vinegar. I'm going to take this measuring cup here, and to the measuring cup, I'm going to add one cup of vinegar solution. The amount of vinegar we use is not super duper crucial as long as it's around one cup. The baking soda is the limiting reactant in our experiment, and that's the one that's going to determine the amount of carbon dioxide produced. I'm going to take my vinegar solution, and I'm going to carefully pour it into my bottle, making sure I transfer as much as possible, and then we're ready to move on to the next step. To continue our setup process for our experiment, we now need to get the baking soda ready to go. One of the tricks in this experiment is combining the two ingredients and getting the balloon attached to the top of the bottle before some of the carbon dioxide starts to escape. We want to capture all of that carbon dioxide into the balloon, and the way we're going to make sure that that happens is by a neat little trick that a lot of people use in experiments like this. We're going to take our baking soda and we're going to add it directly into the balloon itself. This will allow us to attach the balloon onto the bottle first and then get a good seal before all the baking soda gets dumped in so we don't have to worry about losing any of that. To help this process, it's very handy to have a funnel such as this one. I took a small piece of paper, cut, uh, folded it up into a funnel with a small opening at the end, smaller than the mouth of the balloon, and this should get the job done. If you've got a plastic funnel ready to go, you're welcome to use that as well. Anything to get, the job, uh, to get these transferred. Now, before we go any further, the last thing I'll say, uh, I took this balloon earlier and blew it up a couple times fully and then deflated it. This stretches the balloon out a little bit and it prevents it from exerting too much pressure on the gas. 
that pressure is going to be a source of error in the measurements that we make, um, but it's something, like I said, that we can mitigate a little bit simply by inflating the balloon a couple times. So what I'm doing now is I'm putting the opening of the balloon over the end of my funnel. I'm taking my baking soda and carefully pouring it in. You'll find that it actually goes in without too much trouble. Give this guy a little bit of a shake. With a little bit of effort, I was able to transfer all of my baking soda into the actual balloon itself. Now it's time to start setting up our reaction, getting ready to run. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the opening of this balloon. I'm going to open it over the bottle itself. And the goal here is try to create as tight of a seal as possible to make sure that none of our gas escapes while the reaction is running. The way I'm going to do that is by trying to pull the rubber of the balloon past the threads of the bottle so that there's no place for these gases to escape. So there we go. We've got our balloon attached to the bottle. You should probably notice that while I was doing this, I made sure that none of the baking soda inside the balloon got transferred in yet. I don't want the reaction to start until I got this bottle properly sealed over top of the bottle. Now that we got the vinegar measured out, now that we got the baking soda measured out, now that everything's sealed inside of this container, it's time to actually start the reaction itself. Starting a reaction is very simple. I'm going to start by making sure I hold the balloon onto the bottle to make sure that um, none of the, the balloon doesn't accidentally pop off. And then when I'm ready to go, all I need to do is lift up the balloon, tap it a little bit, and you can see the reaction starts pretty much immediately. We can see tons of fizzing down here at the bottom of the container, and we can clearly see that our balloon is starting to inflate. Holding your hands on the balloon like this throughout the entire reaction is a great way to make sure that none of the gases escape through the seal here. Uh, any escaped gases are certainly going to uh, reduce the quality of the outcome of our experiment. And we're basically going to let this reaction run until it is fully completed. Um, as you can see, things are still foaming in the bottle. Let's see if I can relocate a little bit. One thing you can do to help things along a little bit is some stirring like this. This stirring is going to make sure that the chemicals mix together more. It's going to make the reaction happen faster. But as you run this, you're going to eventually notice that the reaction starts to slow down pretty significantly. It seems like most things are done. What you probably can't see in your picture, though, is there's a lot of tiny bubbles stuck to the bottom of the container. And if I tap the bottle like this a couple of times, those bubbles become dislodged and they travel into the solution. As long as those bubbles keep forming and they, you have to keep dislodging them, that means the reaction is still running. And this reaction can take upwards of 10 minutes to fully complete before things are done. Hold the balloon in place, keep stirring, keep dislodging those bubbles until eventually you feel like the reaction has run its course. Once you feel like the reaction is done and you're not seeing any more evidence of bubbles being formed, our last order of business is to get our balloon sealed off so that we can start making some measurements of the volume of the gas inside. I'm going to use my hands to either pinch off the balloon or twist it a little bit to create a nice tight seal to make sure none of my gases escape. And then I'm going to work the balloon back off of the bottle that we originally attached it to. Quickly tie off the balloon, again trying to limit the amount of gases that escape. And then we are ready to move on to some of our measurement steps here to try and determine how much carbon dioxide is in this balloon. Now that our reaction is done, we have collected all the carbon dioxide produced by a reaction inside of this balloon. Our job now is to first determine the volume of carbon dioxide in that balloon and then ultimately the mass of carbon dioxide in that balloon. And this mass of carbon dioxide we calculate is going to be the actual yield of our reaction that we'll then be able to go back and compare to the theoretical yield we calculated earlier. Now there are many ways to measure the volume of this balloon and if you look in the instructions document there's a link that brings you to a page that will describe some of those different methods. You are welcome and encouraged to explore any of those methods that you want to use. The one I have in front of me right now is probably one of the most straightforward uh, and most likely things you have just kicking around the house to get the job done. It is not, however, the most accurate way to measure the volume of the balloon. So if you'd like to challenge yourself a little bit and try something a little fun and interesting, by all means explore that document and see what it is you want to try to make this measurement. To measure our balloon, we're going to make a big assumption. We're going to assume that this balloon is a perfect sphere. 
By assuming it's a perfect sphere, that's going to allow us to do some very simple calculations using the volume of a sphere equation to calculate the volume of the gas inside the balloon itself. To do this, the measurement we're going to have to make is recording the circumference of the balloon, something very easy for us to do. I'm going to use it, do, do it using this me cloth measuring tape right here. If you don't have a cloth measuring tape, a piece of string, and a straight measurement tool like this tape measure would get the job done as well. You could wrap the tool around the balloon, mark the length that goes all the way around the circumference, and then use the measuring tape to measure the length on the string. Using the cloth tape, all we're going to need to do is unravel the tape itself. We're going to pick up our balloon. We're going to place the measuring tape on the balloon at the widest point, and then I'm going to wrap this measuring tape all the way around the balloon, trying not to put any pressure on it. And when I measure this, my measuring tape has a centimeter scale on it here, and it looks like I'm reading 49.1 centimeters as the circumference of this balloon. Now that we've had a chance to measure the circumference of our balloon in centimeters, we can enter that data value into our data table, 49.1 centimeters. Continuing our calculations, our job now is to calculate the radius of the balloon. Ultimately, again, we're trying to determine the volume, but before we can get volume, we'll need the radius. Uh, the good news is, is we can use the circumference that we just measured as a way of calculating the radius using a very familiar equation. Uh, you should remember this from your geometry classes. The circumference of any uh, circle or sphere is 2 pi times r, the radius. And we can resolve that equation for r by seeing that the radius is the circumference divided by 2 pi. If we take the data from our experiment, we determined that the radius of our balloon was 49.1 centimeters. We plug that in, I'm sorry, the circumference was 49.1 centimeters. We plug that in for C, we divide it by 2R, and we've now determined that the radius of our balloon is 7.82 centimeters. As before, let's take a moment to update our data table. We now know the circumference, I'm sorry, the radius of the balloon in centimeters as 7.82 centimeters. So we plug that in. Finally, we're ready to start calculating our volume, the data we were looking for. Uh, just like before, we can use another familiar geometry equation to calculate the volume of the balloon. Now again, this calculation is assuming that the balloon is a perfect sphere. We know that it's not, and this is a potential source of error in our experiments. That non-spherical nature of the balloon means that our volume measurement is going to be a little bit off, but probably still reasonable. If you don't remember from geometry, this is the equation for calculating the volume of the sphere. 4 thirds pi r cubed, r being the radius of the sphere itself. Now if you recall, we calculated that radius in our previous step as being 7.82 centimeters. Plugging that into our volume equation, we get 4 divided by 3 times pi times 7.82 cubed. Let your calculator do all the heavy lifting here, and we find out that the volume of our balloon is 2,002 cubic centimeters, which means we've collected 2,002 cubic centimeters of carbon dioxide. Now before we can go on to update our data table, we do have another conversion we need to do here. Uh, we want to be dealing with a unit that we're a little more familiar with, a little more um, related to the ones we've done in this unit. We want to convert our cubic centimeters into liters. Luckily for us, this is a very simple unit conversion as long as you know that conversion factor. This is something you can either figure out on your own or simply look up online. Turns out that there are 1,000 cubic centimeters for every one liter. We can use this in yet another dimensional analysis step. We'll take the 2,002 cubic centimeters that we got. We'll convert that into liters by lining up units diagonal as set up here, and we'll find out that we have 2.00 liters inside of the balloon that we collected here. I rounded to three significant digits to match the original measurements we started our calculation with. Now that we got our volume in liters, let's update our data table one more time. We're going to plug in the volume of our balloon as 2.00 liters for the volume of the balloon. All right, I know this has been a long mathematical road here from the balloon we collected to the actual answer, but this is the last major step we need to worry about. We want to get the volume of carbon dioxide we collected converted into a mass of carbon dioxide. And these are conversions we've been doing all along throughout this unit. This is a mole conversion. And in fact, it's a mole conversion we can do in two separate steps. We're going to take the liters of gas that we had just figured out and convert that into moles. And then we're going to take the moles that we figure out and convert that into grams. 
The conversion factors for doing this should look relatively familiar. We know the molar mass of carbon dioxide, or at least we can calculate the molar mass of carbon dioxide as being 44.01 grams per mole. And we know from our mole conversions that the molar volume of any gas is 22.4 liters per mole. Now, unfortunately, before we step forward, there's a little bit of a problem here. This molar volume is only true at standard temperature and pressure. And while we're not going to be talking a lot about pressure, standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. That is the freezing point of water. I am very confident that when you performed your experiment, the room you were in wasn't at zero degrees Celsius. It was likely significantly warmer, probably closer to 20 or 25 degrees Celsius based on how warm it was that this day. This means that the molar volume of your carbon dioxide isn't 22.4 liters. It's a different number. If we had more time, we could talk about how to recalculate that number, but the good news is that number can be recalculated. The molar volume of a gas at room temperature is about 24.5 liters per mole. It takes up a little bit more space because the gas is a little bit warm, warmer at room temperature and warmer gases tend to expand just a little bit. Back to the process, we now have our two conversion factors. We have the molar mass of our carbon dioxide and we have our modified molar volume of carbon dioxide, 24.5 liters. This is now a mole conversion just like we've done problems before. Down below here, I've rewritten our two, conver our two um, equalities as mole conversions and we can set up just like any other mole conversion problem. We have our 2.0 liters. I'm going to first convert liters into moles by lining up units diagonal, so we'll be dividing by 24.5. And then we can convert those moles into grams, again by lining up moles diagonal to get an answer in grams of carbon dioxide. And we should be getting, we have gotten then, we've actually collected 3.59 grams of carbon dioxide in our 2 liter balloon. And this is the actual yield of our chemical reaction. This is the real amount of product we were able to, comp uh, we were able to collect collect. Just like before, let's update this data table one more time. We now have collected the actual yield or the mass of carbon dioxide as being 3.59 grams. All right, here we are at the end of the process. Our last job is to calculate the percent yield of our reaction. We've used stoichiometry to determine the theoretical yield of our reaction, and we've actually performed the experiment to determine the actual yield of the reaction. If you recall from earlier in the unit, percent yield is simply the ratio of those two. The actual yield, what we were able to get, divided by the theoretical yield, what we should have gotten, times 100 to get us a percentage. Taking the data from our data table, we were actually able to collect 3.59 grams, whereas we should have made closer to 5.71 grams. Those two numbers divided into one another times 100 means we have a yield of about 62.9%. That is certainly a significantly lower yield than what we'd like to see. Uh, it is certainly a significantly lower yield than people who use the balance, but I think a lot of this has to do with the nature of the way we collected this product. Uh, there's always going to be a little gap that escapes that balloon and because the balloon has a lot of elasticity to it it actually squeezes the gas in there the pressure inside of that container is probably a little bit higher than the pressure we think it is and all of those things are skewing the amount of product we get to make it seem a little bit lower than it is as with all things, I'm not super duper worried about the percent yield that you get. I'm worried to see that you can figure out the percent yield of your reaction and then later on next week explain to me why you believe your percent yield might be a little lower than what we might have expected. Uh, but otherwise, don't worry if your percent yield isn't as high as the one I have here or it isn't as high as some of the yields that other people are getting. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Using a controlled experiment, we were able to do a couple different things. First of all, we were able to predict the mass of carbon dioxide that our reaction should be able to produce based on the amount of sodium bicarbonate we started the reaction with. We did this using stoichiometry, and this told us the theoretical yield of our chemical reaction. We were then labeled, later able to run that chemical reaction, actually collect that carbon dioxide in a balloon. Through a bunch of different measurements, we were able to determine the volume of that balloon, and later the volume we were able to convert into the mass of carbon dioxide that was formed. This mass of carbon dioxide we were really able to make was the actual or real yield of our chemical reaction. Last but not least, we were able to calculate the efficiency of our reaction by calculating a percent yield. And this took the ratio of the theoretical yield to the actual yield. And the higher that percent yield is, the better your reaction ran and the more product you were able to collect. 
As I said earlier, don't worry if your numbers aren't as high as mine. Uh, don't worry if they're different. I'm interested in you getting correct answers based on the data that you were able to actually gather. And I'm interested in you being able to explain why you believe the numbers are the way you got them as opposed to what other groups might have gotten. Uh, we'll talk next week about how you're going to present this information out. But for now, your job is simply to get your data collected and get that information turned in online. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, you'll be able to attend a class this week to learn a little bit more about this process and get those questions answered. And you can always email me at any point in time, and I'll be glad to provide you with the best possible explanation I can through email. Good luck with your experiment, ladies and gentlemen, and I look forward to seeing the results you collect later on this week.